everyone. Welcome back to the Heights podcast. We have on today, Brian Holdsworth. I'm really excited to discuss with Brian actually about his conversion to the Catholic faith. He, he hasn't always been Catholic, obviously. He had a conversion. So we're going to just dis- discuss Catholicism. We're going to talk about how that has just changed his view of himself and his worldview. Uh, I met Brian in Canada in, what, what was the city? Brian in Canada that we well, were speaking the, at the, cl- the closest metropolitan city, which is the, the area that I live in is Edmonton, Alberta. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we were in that area. There's what's called the family life conference an annual conference that they do. And there was a few, couple thousand people there. And that's where I met Brian yeah. for the first time. So Brian, can you just at least share briefly with the, the listeners, mainly the work that you do, particularly with your awesome work on YouTube? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Brennan. Um, well, and, and thanks for the the invitation to come and join you today. I, uh, so I, by my trade is in like graphic design and, and new media, digital media, that kind of thing. That's what I had always wanted to go into from, from a young age. And so, um, that's what I've been doing for the past 20 years or so of my professional life. And, uh, at a certain point, uh, I was, uh, I had a lot of clients that were asking me about video. And so I started to take an interest in videography and, and, um, to make a really long story short, that one thing led to another, and that inspired me to start a YouTube channel in the practice of learning videography. And, um, as sort of a proof of proof of concept that I, I could produce video for, for, uh, especially Catholic apologet- or apologetics and apostles is what I wanted to be doing that work for. And, um, and then slowly my own channel started to, to grow, uh, somewhat unexpectedly. And so, um, that's how I got into it. Um, but I've also always been somebody who has been very interested and invested in, um, uh, philosophy and apologetics and theology as a convert. It was, it was something I had to become familiar with, uh, at least for my own purposes to try to familiarize myself with the, the the various contentions of the different denominations and the different various claims about what the true way to follow Jesus was and so um, that that was an early interest and in something I had to to uh, try and get a handle on in order to to find my own way uh, in my spiritual life and so um, the two just kind of came together and, and and that turned into what what now many people are familiar with in my YouTube channel yeah yeah if you if you haven't seen his YouTube channel. It's a very popular channel, just about the Catholic faith, culture, morality, religion. And he does a great job. I mean, definitely with his editing skills, it's, it, I need to learn from him, but he does a great job. And I, I'll never forget when you told me at the conference we were speaking at of just your inspiration for the different topics. Didn't you say something like, you go for a walk or you maybe it's next to the water or something where you just kind of pray and reflect. Is it, is that right? Well, uh, yeah, there are different uh, modes of inspiration. Probably one of the, one of the, the most common um, activities or, or ways that I get that inspiration is uh, uh, obviously there's, there's, there's the the common ones like just reading, like I'll be reading a book and sometimes I'll, I'll put it down and I'll dictate something to my phone and be like, I gotta, I gotta, expand on this right but you often what happens to me is i'll be up for a run so i usually go for a morning run and um that gives me about half an hour to an hour of just being with my own thoughts sometimes i'll listen to something and that will get the 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 wheels turning and uh, I'll, I'll usually stop listening to whatever it was and then just go on some epiphany tangent in my own mind and then i'll often be dictating to my phone while i'm running to to sort of expand on a particular idea so because i'm afraid of losing it um people think that's pretty weird you know they'll be running past me or, or we'll, we'll cross each other on the paths and i'm ranting at my phone while gasping for air so um but that's yeah that's a, that's a pretty typical way for me to um to connect with god um you know preferably and to spend some time uh let's say contemplating like because contemplation is something that has to be done away from the distractions, right? And running is certainly a, a somewhat of a distraction, but it's also if you're if you're an experienced runner, it's something where you can just get into this rhythm, and everything just sort of kind of fades away, and you can just be with your thoughts. And it's 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 an it's an interesting kind of quiet time. Um, ironically, um, ideally, you'd want to be spending time in actual quiet and contemplation. But for those of us that are a bit more restless, that can be somewhat challenging and especially if we have a busy life and, and a busy domestic environment, which, which I do, I have a lot of kids. So, um, so getting out for a run is a great way to just find that stillness in, in my mind and, and then have the opportunity to, 
see how truth reveals itself in that stillness. Yeah, that's great. You, I know, I think when I met you, your wife was pregnant. Was that correct? Yeah. Is she still, she's still yes. pregnant? Okay. Yeah. And yeah. We're doing number... a couple, couple weeks. Number okay. eight. Number yeah. eight. Cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I, I love what we're about to talk about just being Catholic. I've, I've had a lot of friends who have converted to Catholicism or have left Catholicism. I have talked to so many people that are relativistic where, Hey, you do you, you know, all faiths are equal. Um, but that's just, it's just not true because is there one truth, you know, and, and that changes our whole entire worldview. You know what I learned in my master's program, the word culture comes from the Latin word cultus, and it's a society's belief of who they think they are before God. So we all operate about before God, who we think he is. We might even say he doesn't exist. And that's how I operate and live my life. That's what shapes my morality. So being Catholic, it, it's not just, you know, a hobby, you know, and at least I know that for you, for some, it might be a hobby, but this is foundational to who I am and what the whole world is all about. So I'm going to just give you the reins, Brian. I want you to just tell your story of, you know, what was your faith like before you con converted to Catholicism? Why was it important that you explored the Catholic faith and just truth in general? And then what that has done for you in your life? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say my my journey into faith is is very uh biblical and i don't mean to say that in like the sense that it's epic it's just that it it follows a a particular pattern i think that is very biblical in which people in desperate situations who need a savior are primed for the arrival of the Lord in their life, right? So when he encounters these people who who need healing, who need consolation, um they're they're ready for it, right? They've tried their hand at the world, even the prodigal son as sort of a, 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 a like an, an exemplification of this, right? He's he's gone out into the world. He's experienced all the the, the pleasures and the promises that the, the world has to offer, and he's been burned by it. He's been disappointed by it. It didn't deliver what he needed, right? And so my life up until the time I was about 18, 19 years old had been that. It had been one of, okay, I'm going to go out, I'm going to chart my course, I'm going to lay my claim, I'm going to experience all the things I want, I'm going to satisfy my appetite. And, you know, I turn around at around that age, and I realized that, you know, my life's not going in the direction that I thought it would it would just inevitably go. I'm facing a lot of personal failure. I'm like, I didn't get into the college program I wanted to get into. Um, I'm I'm sort of working at a dead end job part time. Uh, a lot of my friends are going off to college. Uh, my girlfriend isn't very nice to me. This this situation isn't a lot of fun, right? And I was, uh, I was so I was taking this inventory of my life and realizing, you know, this isn't what I wanted for my life. And now I'm an adult, and no one's going to hold my hand or make excuses for me anymore. I have to, I have to figure this out, and. The, the the way of sort of coasting on the conventional worldly wisdom that I had been brought up with, which was just sort of secular agnosticism in the conventional wisdom of popular culture, um, had failed me. Um, it had it had led me towards a dead end, sort of moral relativism and and practical atheism, let's say. And so, at that point, I realized like. First of all, I have to own this to some degree. These these are my failures. I haven't been living my life the way I ought to. But then you inevitably arrive at the question, well, how ought I to live my life? This, this presupposes that there is a right way and a wrong way, that all of our decisions and all of our choices and actions accumulate into a life, right? And is it a, is it a good life? Is it the life that's going to propitiate or... or is it going to create and cultivate joy in your life? Or is it going to be the kind that's going to lead you to despair and to um, depression and 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 um, shame and guilt and and just the, the outcomes that you don't want in your life? So would, would and, you say, it, is that the reason why it was a dead end? Like this moral relativism? Was it just like I wasn't experiencing joy? Or meaning well, or fulfillment was that cer certainly that, um, but but prior to, I would say my emotional constitution was the circumstances of my life. Right um, up until that point in my life, I I was the kind of person who could achieve 
a satisfactory measure of success with a very minimal amount of effort, right? Like at a certain amount of just, let's say, intellectual aptitude that could be applied to school where I wouldn't have to study very hard. And I could get reasonably decent grades, right, without putting in much effort. And that taught me a very terrible work ethic. And nobody at any point really stepped in and said, hey, Brian, like, I know you're you're getting, you know, B's and a minuses and stuff, but you seem like you could do a lot better than that. Nobody, nobody at any point said, Hey, you have a terrible work ethic. Grow up, you know, like I just didn't have that kind of mentorship. Um, and so, so I hit this, like I hit a, a very circumstantial dead end, which was that I expected to get into college applying this minimal amount of effort. I wanted to go into um, visual communications was a program that I had identified. Um, what I wanted to be was a graphic designer. That was what I, that's what I've become. But, but prior to that, there wasn't like a graphic design degree in any of the colleges that I could go to. And, and web design was another thing I was interested in. There weren't any programs like that. And so visual communication seemed to be this kind of program I wanted to get into and they required a portfolio. So I was like, well, I've got some sketches and things like that. Cause I was always into art growing up and I went to art classes in high school, but like these were not exceptional pieces that you put into a portfolio. Right. Um, so I just, I don't know, I haphazardly pieced something together and threw it into a, a binder and sent it off and thought, yeah, you know, this is, again, my, my, my experience has always confirmed this minimal amount of effort is all I need to do to get what I want in life. And sure enough, I did not get accepted to the program, um, which was a shock to me. I just thought like, what? Oh no, that was my, that was my one plan. I don't have a backup plan here, you know? And, and then, so September comes around and the rhythm of my life every year has been September. You go off to school, right? You go off with your peers and it's exciting and it's new, but it's also familiar. And it's, um, it's just the rhythms of life. And for the first time in my life, September came around and I wasn't going off to school. I wasn't doing anything. I was waiting for my next shift at the paint store that I had worked through all through high school, um, just to, to pay my car insurance and gas money. And now I had no reason to, to go to that job to earn, you know, uh, uh, a measly amount of money to to continue doing what I've been doing, you know, hanging out with my friends, going to the bar on the weekends and things like that. Like it just, it was an unfulfilling moment in my life where I, I felt failure. I felt guilt. I felt shame. I, I felt um, that I wasn't doing life right and I needed to do it right. Um, and again, that, that presupposes that there is a wrong way to do life, which I was recognizing in everything that had accumulated into this moment in my life. Um, but if that's true, if, the, if there is a wrong way, presumably there's a right or a better way to live your life, um, which I, I was convinced of, but I didn't know what that looked like. And simultaneously, I was always, I always had a suspicion that God existed. And I even remember vaguely making, uh, deals with God at a younger age, sort of saying like, you know, I know one day I have to become a good person, but not right now. Right now I want to have fun. I want to hang out with my friends. I want to get into trouble. I want to experience pleasure to its fullest, fullest capacity in whatever ways that I can uh, appease my appetites. But one day, you know, God, I'll, I'll, I'll smarten up and I'll, I'll become a good person. And so that vague notion of a contract started to occur to me again, like, hey, maybe this is the moment you want to become a good person. And maybe God has something to do with that, right? Maybe that still small voice that has been speaking to you throughout your life, call it your conscience, or call it God, um, is now inviting you back to that table to discuss your life in the direction of your life again. And uh, simultaneously, I had um, my my girlfriend, who I had mentioned that I, I didn't have a great relationship with, uh, she uh, she was the kind of person who would move from one best friend to the next. Like every three months, she would have a new best friend. And that person, she would adopt all of their interests and mannerisms and style and taste in music and all these things, right? She was just kind of a chameleon that way. And her new best friend was a mutual friend that we had had at high school who, as it turns out, was actually a faithful person. She was Catholic, um, but she was a practicing Christian, which I didn't even know about her. Um, um, her uh, what, what, what can we name her? We'll name her um, Jennifer <laughs> for the sake of convenience. Oh, that's my, that's my so mom's Gen name. <laughs> okay, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so Jennifer, um, like I, I was, I was fairly good friends with her. Um, 
I was into snowboarding. I still kind of am to whatever degree I can actually do it. But um, she and I would go snowboarding fairly often together. And and religion was something that never came up, interestingly enough. But I was surprised to discover that um, she comes from a fairly devout family and and that um, her mom was hosting a Bible study, what they called a Bible study. But it was really just sort of a prayer meeting. And my girlfriend, who's who looked at Jennifer as her new best friend, was all infatuated with this idea of going to the Bible study and doing whatever it is that Jennifer does. And um, and so she insisted that I come to the Bible study. And I was like, I have no interest in going to a Bible study. That's just not part of Canadian culture at all. Like, at, at least in certain sectors of American culture, you will have like evangelicals who were raised in a church environment, right? And go to Bible studies and, and study the Bible and talk about sort of bi- biblical morality and spirituality and things like that. That doesn't exist in Canada at all, unless you're just sort of part of a subculture, right? So for me, I was like, no, I'm not going to a Bible study. That's just completely foreign to my social experience. And and what would my friends think of that, you know? But my my girlfriend, as I said, she wasn't very nice to me. So she insisted that I go to the Bible study. And so I did. And um, the witness of Jennifer's mom, especially who was leading this Bible study, um, was kind of captivating to me. She was a kind of person I had, she, she, she was a person that wasn't like anybody else I'd ever really met before. Um, in this, in the sense that she was clearly a very humble and gentle person. Um, but also very strong in her identity and, 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 um, her, I, she just had this undeniable personal strength and direction in life. And that seemed paradoxical to me because humility to me always meant sort of um like uh being down on yourself right like to be humble meant um to think of yourself in a lowly way um and that pride was almost a virtue in that sense right the way that we think of like patriotic pride right um or pride in your accomplishments whereas she was obviously humble um, but also still strong. And she, had a, she had this in her strength. And that m- made me want to learn more about her and her way of life. And, and I just liked being around her, the, having her lead us through these prayer exercises and the way that she would invite us to talk about certain aspects of our life. I never had an adult take that kind of an interest in me who wasn't either obligated out of familiar relationship or out of um, institutional obligations because they were my teacher or something, right? She was just genuinely interested in who I was as a human being, and and I was taken aback by that. And so I continued. My girlfriend and I eventually broke up, and she found a new best friend. But Jennifer and I became very close, and and I continued to go to the the Bible study and become very close with her family. And that continued to force a confrontation on the question of God. Like, does God exist? And if so, is he the key to finding a direction in life? And so one day after uh, a Bible study, I went home uh, sort of later at night, and um, I got home, and it seemed that nobody was was there, which was typical of of, of my family life at the time. Uh, my parents were divorced. My mom was often out socializing or uh, going on dates or whatever, and uh, my brothers were, you know, they were out doing their own thing. And so I got home, and nobody was home. And so I just, I didn't turn the lights on. I just went and sat down, and I decided to pray on my own for, you know, the first time in uh, in memory that I, I can think of. And I asked God, well, do you exist? Uh, do you care about my life? And if so, can you reveal yourself to me? Can you make yourself known to me in some way? And if you do, then I commit to following you. I commit to devoting myself to finding what it is that you want me to do with my life. And, you know, let's say supernatural or mystical experiences are are difficult to describe because they're experiential, but they're not experiential in a way that is uh, is kind of neutral to us, right? Like we, you and I both have eyesight as a sense organ, right? And so I can say, hey, look over there, and you can look over there, and we can both see the same thing, right? We can both have this simultaneous experience. But these sort of inner experiences of the, of the inner spiritual life um, are not shared or not as easily described in the same way. Whereas I can say, hey, the sky's blue, right? And you'll say, yeah, the sky's blue. Whereas if I say, hey, I had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, you're like, oh, what's that like? Because I've had something that I would describe in that way, but it's like, it's not 
it's not so easily um, shared as an experience, right? And so th that's my precursor to saying I had an experience of God's presence in that moment. And it was so undeniably an experience that I had, that I sensed, um, that it convinced me that I had, to do, I had to change my life from that moment on. I had to devote myself to knowing God and to having that reflected in the way that I live my life. And that's about as far as I understood what that meant. And since the inspiration to, to explore that came through a Bible study, um, Christianity seemed to be the first open door to me, right? And so I knew that Jesus was going to be um, my guide. <laughs> I didn't really understand that he was God or the incarnation or the Trinity or any of that sort of theology. I just knew that Jesus was the son of God, whatever that means, and that he had the answers to whatever it was that I was looking for. And so from that day forward, I considered myself a seeking Christian, so to speak. Wow. So how old are you at this time? Okay. Okay. I think, you know, oftentimes when I talk to young people, whether it's like high schoolers, I always just encourage them, like, you need to ask yourself the question, who is the man for the men? Who is the man I want to be for the women? Who is the woman that you want to be? I think so many people go through life without asking that deep question of like, who am I? how am I called to live and actually take it seriously? So many people just, just go on through life and then life gets busy. And then it's like they're 40 years old and now someone's sick in their life. And it, yeah. And it, for me, it was, my brother had a traumatic brain injury when I was a senior in high school. And that it took, it was that, that took me to ultimately ask that question, you know, who am I? Like, cause I was just, I was a Catholic, but I was mostly just because that's just what you do. You know, you, you go to math and you pray. And so at this point you're, you're seeking, you've made the decision. Okay, Jesus, I, I think you're my guide. I'm going to seek Christianity. What led you to Catholicism in particular? I, I talked to so many Christians. I I'll, I'll just be honest. Maybe we have some non-denominational or denominational non-Catholic Christians listening but I hear often like, hey, we're, we're all just a Christian family. You know, we're all really the same. And there's aspects where, okay, there's a lot of similarities. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. You know, we all believe in the Trinity. We all believe Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. But there are also some extreme differences as well that about salvation you know, that's a huge question. How is one saved about a sacramental worldview, how you see all of life, who God is, who you are. It, it, there are big differences. So what led you to, ex, you know, explore mostly Catholicism? Were you just on a journey? I'm going to just look into all of these different denominations of Christianity. And then was there a, a moment, whether it was an encounter within the Catholic church that led you to say, I want to be Catholic. I think this is the fullness of truth. So yeah, what led you to that? So in as far as I understood what it meant to be a Christian, I, I thought, okay, there's two things I need to start doing. I need to start reading the Bible, which wasn't like, I, I wasn't familiar. Like, okay. So I had, a, we had a Bible. I was baptized. My, my ancestors were like mainline, uh, Protestant Christians, but I, I hadn't read the Bible. I hadn't spent a lot of time with it. So it was pretty unfamiliar. And I knew I had to become more familiar with it. Um, and then the other thing I, I felt compelled to do was to go to church on Sundays um, for two reasons. One just felt that like my conscience was, um, was telling me I needed to do that, but also because I wanted to I wanted somebody to tell me what it means to be a Christian. Okay, so I'm a Christian now. Tell me how to do that. What does that look like? How do I how do I adopt your way of life, and how do I fit my life on top of that? Um, so I was hoping to like hear some sermons. Tell me, tell me this way. Teach me, right? Um, but where, what church? I don't know. I, I I I guess my impression was 
they're all Christian and it doesn't really matter. Just find one that kind of works for you. Right. And so the obvious place to go was back to the church that I was baptized in, which uh, in Canada is called the United Church, was the the uniting of uh, like the, a lot of the mainline uh, den- non-Anglican denominations. So it would have been like Presbyterians and, and Methodists and, and, and uh, some of those strands. Um, but by the time I was now uh, exploring Christianity, the United Church of Canada had basically become a kind of a spiritual front for trade unions and um, democratic socialism, basically. Um, so mostly political and what we would now call woke, you know, like just very, very much that. And so I went, I went there on for their Sunday service expecting to hear about the Christian religion, but instead I was hearing about, you know, local politics uh, controversies and, and politicians that they disapproved. And I just thought, wow, that's not what I'm here for at all. I think I have a, a decent grasp of my own mind when it comes to politics. I want to, I want to know who Jesus is and how I, how I follow him and what do his teachings mean? Um, so I tried a few other churches and I just didn't feel a strong pull in any particular direction. And simultaneously, I was just getting frustrated with the fact that my initial assumption that they're all Christian and they will all be a a, a relatively reliable guide to following Jesus wasn't wasn't true in my experience of, of having explored them. They were all emphasizing different things. Some were contradicting others. And I just thought, well, Jesus isn't incoherent in himself. His way can't be incoherent. This life that I feel God calling me to, if it's the right way, it can't be incoherent. I can't go left on Tuesday and right on Wednesday. That's that's not a way to live your life. You know, I need direction in my life. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to continue reading the Bible. Um, and primarily the New Testament was where I started there. But this question of churches seems unresolved. And I I need to try and understand that a little bit better. So I started trying to read about church history. um, And and I started to familiarize myself to whatever degree I could with uh, the concepts, um, especially, you know, why is there Catholicism? And why is there Protestantism? And um, what was what was the main controversy between that divide, um, historically? Uh, So so I started to read about the the various claims um, between between the two, and then, like I said, simultaneously reading the Bible and reading the Bible without any theological prejudices. You know, a lot of people, and 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 they don't realize this, and I see this coming across all the time in the comments on my channel for people who are uh, trying to dispute me on my Catholicism. They'll say certain theological tradition, uh, certain theological ideas that come from a theological tradition that they're taking for granted is the biblical idea. And it's like, well, no, you're reading the Bible through a lens, through a theological lens, through all of the sermons that you've heard, through all the Bible studies you've gone to, um, through a formula, a theological formula. And I was reading the the Bible without any of that. Um, Chesterton in... um, I think it's in The Everlasting Man, talks about like this hypothetical scenario where a person from outer space came to, uh, a moon man came here and and read the Bible for the first time. What would he take from it? What would his extraction be? Like this truly objective observer. And and then he sort of extracts this, this interesting narrative out of that. And I felt like I truly was as close to that as you could be, because I didn't come from any sort of tradition. I didn't go to church growing up, right? And so I was just reading... The, the gospel narratives and the teachings and the parables of Jesus and thinking like, okay, there's there's some things here that are very confounding, but there's some things that are just very synoptically obvious, like uh, he chose 12 apostles and he just spent years hammering these lessons into them, um, sometimes in, 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 in a, an unfriendly manner, right? Like he would rebuke them sometimes and, and get impatient with them sometimes and say, guys, don't you get this? How long do I have to put up with you guys? Like, and he would just continue to, to pour these lessons into them. And then eventually, you know, he dies, he's resurrected, and then he commissions them to go out and to carry on because he's not going to continue to do it. He could have. He was alive. He was he his incarnate uh, presence was still available and he could have continued to carry on his ministry, but he didn't. He commissioned them and sent them out as apostles to continue doing so. Um, That was obvious to me. 
And then as you continue to read the narrative through the acts and through the letters, you see what it is that they go on to do, which is to act and to teach and to write authoritatively, both um, in the written form and orally. Um, authoritatively, a kind of authority that I thought, okay, well, if that's what the church looks like, where where are these these authoritative people today? Who speaks and writes with that kind of authority? And what I found in the Protestant churches that I was attending was that um, not only do they not speak or write with that kind of authority, they claim that authority just doesn't exist. And they claim to be the biblical Christians. And I just thought, I'm reading the Bible right now, and it obviously, Jesus obviously um, transmits his authority. And then they exercise it very clearly in Scripture, in the narrative of Scripture, and in the teachings of Scripture. And so I thought, okay, well, who claims that kind of authority? And as far as I could tell, only the Catholic Church um, in the Western tradition, in Western culture, which is where I, this is the context I found myself in. Obviously, we could talk about Eastern Orthodoxy, but that was just so foreign to my radar at the time that... Um, that it just didn't, it wasn't a consideration. And so Catholicism seems to be the one that um, at least claims to have that authority. Um, and so I started to explore, okay, well, why did Protestants then reject that authority? And what were the various theological contentions? And, you know, I looked at some of their particular doctrines, the solas, as they are known, especially sola scriptura and sola fide. And then I compared that to again, just the the very plain reading of scripture, the things that did seem obvious to me. And it just didn't, that didn't uh, cohere, um, the, the the doctrines of Martin Luther and the other reformers, like Sola Scripture and Sola Fide. And so um, I found myself very reluctantly agreeing with the Catholic Church. And I say that because um, there were other um, evangelical churches that I had attended by this point that uh, were much more attractive to me. Um, they, they were attracting other people my age. Uh, culturally, they seemed to be more forgivable among my peers. You know, if, if I went to one of these, I didn't have to talk a certain way or, or dress a certain way to fit in. Like I could just be a bit more natural. And I was kind of hoping that this is where I could find my fit. You know, the music was good. The preaching was good. My peers were there. But ultimately, they were descended from uh, this root of Protestantism that uh, was was uh, fallacious in its uh, its assumptions and its doctrines, and so um, I found myself agreeing with the Catholic Church, and then I decided, okay, well, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to become Catholic at this point. So I signed up for RCIA, and the the rest is sort of history, so to speak. Was it just that easy? Where I mean, did you have to explore? Okay, I'm gonna explore deep teachings on the Eucharist about Mary, mm. the Mother of God. Yeah, uh, about the Pope. I mean, did you have to dive into all of these different aspects yeah. that a lot of people will say makes Catholic distinct? Or was it like, mm. no, I just have had a sense. I thought the church, Catholic Church was the authoritative church. And after that, I just kind of went. Yeah, so I would say I explored Protestantism in as far as I understood it. And to me, that meant two big doctrinal um, agreements that I had to make with Sola Scripture and Sola Fide. And I, I I couldn't agree with either of those. They just they seemed obviously wrong to me. Um, and so then, if it's not sola scripture, what is it? Um, and that became a question of authority for me. And like I said, I was reading. I, I believed in the authority of the Bible. That was just assumed, right? Like this is the word of God. And and I had already um, started to uh, started to use it as a tool to for direction in my life, as I had said. And so um, that was an authority that I accepted. So what was that authority telling me? That authority was telling me that there was also another authority, which was the church. Um, and, and you know, I would read things like uh, Matthew 16, 18, where Peter, Simon, is renamed Rock, you know, in, in, in Aramaic Cephas or Caiaphas, which means rock, right? Um, so the, the Protestant claims that what's actually happening here is that Jesus is identifying Peter's faith as the rock, or that he's he's, he's named him um, Petros in Greek, which means little pebble, right? Um, none of that made sense to me. Um, because first of all, he his name wasn't Petros, it was Cephas. He was using Aramaic. Petros comes from the Greek translation um, of the Gospels, um, or the way that they were written in Koine Greek, right? Um, but we know that Jesus spoke Aramaic and that, and that, uh, Paul, even in, in his letters calls Peter Cephas, right? And so we know that his name was rock. It wasn't little pebble. It was rock. And so the claim that 
that Jesus was only identifying his faith as the rock. It's like, no, he didn't. He didn't, he didn't say, Simon, you have such a great rock or you're, you're such a rock like person. He's like, no, you are rock. I'm renaming you. Your title is rock. You're the rock upon which I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And whatever you, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, this kingdom that he's been pre- preaching about through his whole ministry. Um, whatever you bind will be bound in heaven and on earth. Whatever you loose will, be, will loose in heaven and earth. Heaven itself will be compromised by your teachings. If that's not an indisputable authority, a divine authority to, to, um, to oversee the kingdom of God, I mean, my goodness, like what more does he need to say? How much more hyperbole would be necessary there to say, yeah, okay, there is a singular figure here who is going to lead the church and who's going to be a reliable foundation for the church to teach and to govern. Yeah. And I don't know the entire context, but when Jesus said that to Peter, you are rock right behind Jesus was, yeah. what What was it called? You know, it was the big rock. Yeah. The boulder. Like, yeah. Yeah, the, on the mountainside the, there. Like I forget the name too, like but hell or something for the pagans or so, something like that. Oh yeah, um, Ge- it could be Gehenna that, that you're talking. So there's a valley of Gehenna. I don't know if that was part of the context. Yeah, but, yeah. I don't know, but I just remember, like, yeah, like it's, it, it's not this little pebble because actually, right behind Jesus was this giant boulder rock that everyone knew about, and it was like the place next to. I could be wrong, but like it was pagan temples or next to a temple area where through mm. that doorway, it was like, this is hell. Like this is the sign yeah. of hell. And Jesus is saying yeah. the gates of hell, referring yeah. to that as well, will not prevail right. against my church. And then yeah. just going on to the context, what I've learned about like the Old Testament kingdom where mm. there was the Al-Habayit, which is the prime mm-hmm. minister, where if the king left in the, you know, the king would give the prime minister, the Al-Habayit, keys right as as an authoritative figure authority on behalf of the king it's like okay jesus is the king of kings he didn't come to abolish the law and all the pro no he came to fulfill his kingdom i give you the keys peter yeah okay he's he's the prime minister that passes on you know christ passing on the keys as a sign of his authority and you know when you read it in that context it's just like okay huh this is interesting or just even the idea of the sins you forgive are forgiven. The sins you retain are retained. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're a Jew, yeah, when Jesus says to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, what do they say to Jesus? You yeah. blaspheme. Blasphemous. Because only yeah. God forgives sins. And then right. he's giving that through scripture. You can just read. Uniquely or, divine you authority. Forgive. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's like, right. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. So you became, or you had some about that uh, so I, I i started attending mass at that point um and i continued to study just to I, i'm a, a cautious temperament and so i you know i didn't just jump fully in i continued to study scripture there were a lot of uh scripture verses we've, we've described a few here you know that that narrative in matthew with 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 peter and the apostles um you you mentioned john 20 receive the holy spirit who sins you forgive they are forgiven who sins you retain they are retained <laughs> it's amazing how I, I, I get especially I see this mostly in the comments on my channel where people will say like where's reckons where's confession in the Bible and I'll say how how have you not seen it it's right there in John twenty and and you get this sort of like dumbfounded reaction from people who were convinced that they they've never they've never heard that in in scripture before I was talking with a, a, another. Um, uh, acquaintance who is Protestant recently. Um, this wasn't online. This was verbally, and um, talking about authority, and um, and he said, you know, like, but isn't the Catholic Church kind of Pharisaical with all of this priestly authority and stuff? And I said, well, he, maybe in some respects it is, but what did Jesus say about the Pharisees and the, and, and the priests? He said they sit in the seat of Moses. Therefore, you have to follow them. They have that authority. Don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. And this is something that we as Catholics need to um, come to terms with, right? Like we can we can have bad shepherds, hypocrites, but they still exercise his his divine authority the the offices that he established right and so when i had said that to to this friend of mine he said that's not in the bible and i was like yeah yeah it is he was sure uh, but it's right there in the gospel of matthew right the the whole john 6 narrative blew my mind and especially um 
uh, Scott Hahn's exposition and exegesis on it, right, um, about about the bread of life and the Eucharist. How how could you interpret that any other way? That was just in the gospel this past Sunday at, at Mass, right? And it's like, I can see, yeah, Jesus uses other metaphors, like, I am the way, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Okay, fine. But he doesn't go then on to say, no, 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 guys, I'm the true vine. Unless you grow off of me like barnacles, you're not going to have, like, he doesn't continue to double down over and over and over again with all these other metaphors. And then when they get kind of disturbed by his doubling down, and then they, they say like, whoa, how can you hold on, Jesus? Like, this is kind of disturbing. How can you give us your body and your flesh to eat and your blood to drink? And he doubles down again. And he says, does this offend you? This is the way to eternal life, right? And they get so offended that they then leave, right? They don't leave when he says, I'm the vine or any of these other metaphors, right? They leave because they're taking him literally because he obviously intended them to take him literally. That just seems so undeniable to me. Again, from the the, the fairly plain reading of scripture that I was, I was, I was studying myself. Um, Sola Scriptura was just another difficulty that I, I, I could not reconcile. You know, the Scripture never, the Bible never teaches that anywhere. And in fact, in order for it to teach that, it would have two things would have to be true. It would have to, um, it would have to explicitly define itself, define what the Bible is, the canon of Scripture, and then say that that is the highest and sole authority for resolving um, theological and moral uh, controversies. Um, and then it would also never identify any other alternative authority with um, similar or, or similar degrees of authority. We already said that it does. It identifies the apostles and Peter in the church with that kind of authority. Um, St. Paul, in, in his letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy, says that the church is the pillar of truth. Um, you know, we, we already talked about the uh, the authority to forgive sins, a uniquely divine authority. Um, Jesus tells Peter in in uh, in John twenty one, I think, to feed his sheep. This sort of like um, overturning of his three his threefold denial of Jesus, his threefold feed my sheep. Right, I'm commissioning you now to be the one who is the shepherd of my flock, this flock that I care so deeply about. Um, his whole. Um, his whole his dying prayer in uh, in John's gospel in I think it's in John 17 um, that was so pivotal for me right like reading his his last prayer to the Father about how they would be one as he and the Father are one um, of the, these who the Father has given him and how their unity will glorify him and reveal to the world that he really is the Son of God. Well, I looked around and I was like, who? Who is the, the the church that is promoting that kind of unity? Because Protestantism, the etymol, etymology of it is to protest, to 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 divide, to object, right? And they weren't reformers. They didn't reform from within. They split off, and then they split off again, and then they split off again within their own lifetime, within that single generation of initial reformers. They they already couldn't agree and get along. Um, they 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 were schismatic in that regard. They were tearing at the flesh of the body of Christ. Um, who was promoting unity? As far as I could tell, it was the, it was the Catholic Church who really cared about following and and um, honoring Christ's dying prayer of, of unity. So these were all things that I was sort of working through. Um, I'd say the last one uh, was was. Uh, the devotion to the saints and and Marian devotion, which was just a practice that was very foreign to me. I knew that if the church had authority to bind and to loose, to lock and to unlock, because they had the keys to the kingdom, well then fine, okay, whatever they bind and loose, it binds my conscience. That's what it is that they have the keys to, right? If I'm a citizen of this kingdom and Peter has the keys to that kingdom. He's been commissioned by the king, the one true head of the church and, and of the world, which is Christ. Well, then he binds my conscience as well. And so if he says um, doctrinally, dogmatically, these certain things that we are to acknowledge about Mary, the mother of God, well, then consider my conscience bound. But I didn't understand it, right? It was sort of like all of these things that Catholics do, statues and things like that. I was like, oh, I don't know, this is weird. So I was reading uh, True Devotion to Mary that someone had recommended to me uh, by Louis de Montfort. And there's a, um, not a shrine, there's a, um, uh, what do you call it, a grotto um, in one of the local Catholic parishes that is, is sort of meant to look like the, the, the grotto at Lourdes. 
Um, and so it's it's kind of built up and there's this little opening where there's a statue of Mary there. And so it was a summer evening. I went there with this book because I was almost done reading it. And um, so I was finishing up the last chapter, just reading it on a bench in this grotto. And um, evening was falling, the sun was going down, and um, I closed it. And I remember um, just saying a Hail Mary, I think for the first time, like, like as, a, as my own expression of devotion. And as soon as I finished, um, I opened my eyes and all the lights in the grotto opened, uh, came on. Um, and which was just, you know, that could be a coincidence, but for me, a very dramatic moment where the, the spotlights on Mary turned on and, I, and she was just there for me, illuminated. And I just thought, wow, like what a thing to happen um, right after seeing my first Hail Mary, right? So, um, so that was my experience of coming to know her as my mother. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. No, I, yeah. something that I've learned just in my own faith journey, because I, similar to you, I, I mean, I was always Catholic, but in college, I had the moment of, I need to explore why I believe this. And yeah. if it's truth, I need to learn it, live it and tell everyone. And, you know, what you're saying, what I've come to learn is what the church teaches. It's, it's reasonable. Like, it's yeah. it's grounded in reason. It makes sense. Like if we're honest yeah. with reading scripture, you know, one of my good friends from high school, he was Catholic, but he left the faith and yeah. I, I showed him John six and I was uh -huh. like, just tell me what you think of this. And he's like, Oh, he's definitely being literal. Like yeah. he was just, I mean, it didn't convert him like on the spot, but he was just like, right. Oh yeah, right. Jesus is definitely being literal about body and blood. And yeah. so it's very reasonable. And maybe we conclude with maybe you telling whether it's Catholics themselves, what would you say to Catholics um, who might not be fully bought into the Catholic faith? Maybe they've just been mm. raised Catholic. It's what, what they just do. And there's a um, part of them that's like, yeah, I think it's right, you know, but they're just, they're not bought in. What would you maybe yeah. say to people who are exploring uh, their own faith journey who may not be Catholic, you know, what would you, what advice would you give to them? Yeah. So I, I would say that there's, there's a real obvious risk in uh, Catholic culture where we go through the motions, right? And we never really have this encounter with, with the Lord. And you hear this from a lot of fallen away Catholics who became born again, right? They say that nobody ever taught me about a, a, a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And and then I found that in um, some some evangelical or Protestant context, and then I got saved, and now I know and love the Lord, which is great. Um, for the Catholics that are just kind of complacently identifying as Catholic, and maybe sometimes they go to Mass, and when their, their guilt is really um, too abrasive, they might go to confession or something like that. I would say, um, take a step back from the practice um, don't stop practicing. I'm not saying that, but just like intellectually and personally take a step back from the practice and ask your abiding question of God. Um, the same kind of question that I ask, and probably you have as well, and, and so many people who now have what I would call a supernatural faith, because you can have a faith in which you observe the practices. Um, that's a kind of faith, but it's a very empty faith that it's not, you know, faith needs to have a dimension of trust in it. Well, am I just trusting in disciplines and practices? That's, that's not going to carry you through in your humanity. You need to trust in God, the person, the threefold persons of, of, of the, the, the divine Godhead and come to know, especially Jesus. That's why he became incarnate, right? So ask your question, um, is all of this true? Does it matter? Does my life matter? Do you care about me? And do you want to direct me in my life? Um, ask him that question and do it sincerely, uh, earnestly. Um, send out your distress signal into the universe and see what comes back. And in my experience, I experience the presence of God very, very tangibly. And I think that if, um, if you do that as well, uh, it will change your life for the better. Um, that That's... That's the best advice I've ever given. That that's the most effective ev evangelical um, advice I've ever given people. You know, you can argue things and you can debate things and you can try to intellectualize them all, and as long as they remain remotely cerebral, they will never really convert the heart, right? And um, 
in my experience, like the, my wife, my now wife, when we were we were dating, she was something of an atheist at the time. Um, around, this is when I was in RCIA, and um, and she took an interest because she knew that it was so important to me. And uh, instead of me getting belligerent and trying to argue with her, I just said, you know what? I just dare you to pray, see what happens, and. Um, and she eventually accepted that dare, and she had a miracle happen. Her her experience was much more um, dramatic than mine was. She had a, a dramatic healing take place in her life um, from a mental ailment that had afflicted her for all, for years. Um, just ended the day she prayed. And so I'm not promising miracles for people to do this, but I am convinced of God uh, and His uh, His interest in your life enough that if you if you take that dare. Um, all of these practices that you've been going through the motions of for, for um, this sort of emptiness and complacency that can kind of accompany them will will suddenly be transformed into something um, inspiring and exciting in your life. It will become like uh, this dynamism that that shapes your life, this wave that you'll start riding, that's this crest of God's presence in your life um, that you can you can ride out uh, with him. And uh, it's just so worth doing. I, 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 I can't I, I, I can't I can't articulate it well enough to just yeah. say why it's so worth doing. But but do yeah. it. All right, everyone take that dare. Take that dare. Yeah. I love it. So Brian, other than your YouTube channel, it's just Brian Holdsworth, right? Your YouTube channel. Yeah. Is there anywhere? Yeah, yeah. If you just search Brian else? Holdsworth on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. So any, I'm on anything? Twitter and, and Facebook yeah. and places like that. But uh, okay. my, my website, BrianHoldsworth.ca. Um, okay. You could find me there if you if you want to uh, connect okay. to any of those platforms. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Brian, for the discussion and your witness. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Brian. Oh